Okay, come on, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Sean. <laughs> Hello, I'm Benny. So, um, who of you has seen one of our sessions uh, before? Awesome. Ah, good. Very good. So, so this is the, uh, this is I think the sixth phase of the yep. results that we've compiled. And uh, to date, I think we've collected uh, well in excess of uh, over 3,000 videos that we have uh, used in the development of these materials. This new uh, set of phase six results is about 700 new videos uh, that we have built over the last about uh, three weeks. And so we're, we're uh, not going to show you 700 videos. I obviously won't have time for that. But I thought we did. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but we've sort of okay. picked some that we think yeah. are interesting that we'd like to share with you. Okay. What we're going to do is... We're well, we didn't say what, the, what we're actually talking about. Well, okay. What are we actually talking about? RDP8 and remote effects compared to, well, other protocols, but also compared between different versions of the uh, Microsoft protocol. And we should be clear in here in the, in the terminology because the Microsoft guys make this very confusing for us. Um, <laughs> Microsoft uses the moniker remote effects to talk about the whole graphics user experience within the Windows environment when you're remoting it and all that kind of stuff. And RDP8 uh, is just one protocol implementation that is part of remote effects, much like RDP7, 7.1, that kind of stuff. But um, I sort of like to differentiate them only because uh, when Microsoft originally came out with remote effects, it was a virtualized graphics technology. And by the way, um, you can get into a lot of debate with different people in the graphics industry of what actually is a virtual GPU and what actually isn't oh. a virtual GPU. Um, so what Microsoft implementation actually is is something called API Intercept, which is a little bit different than a virtualized GPU, and we'll get into that a bit later. Good. So what we're going to do is very briefly talk about how graphics remoting works and how RDP and remote effects work. Then about how we set up our test labs. Uh, so uh, we invested a lot of time and effort to build two test labs that are pretty similar on both sides of the, uh, well, of the big ocean. Uh, one in Europe and one over here in the US. Uh, and we're going to present you 2D test results. So that's going to be the majority of, of uh, videos that we will be showing. Now we're going to go to the 3D graphics remoting and show you the results of, the, uh, of, of those tests. And in the end, a short summary. Yeah. And, and we're going we're to cover the intro to this uh, very quickly because yeah. some of you have seen this presentation before. Many so we'll skim through that before. very quickly. Yeah. And then we'll do a, a bulk of the presentation will be video results. Yeah. Good. Hey, you want to take that? No. Ha. <laughs> I got a lot of talking to do when we do the video. Oh, so OK, you, OK, you, OK. You, you, you talk now. So uh, what I've done here, I created this slide because sometimes it's really confusing what happens when you do graphics remoting uh, on top of a hypervisor. So I put that all together in, in, in one uh, picture. And it was inspired by a slide that was uh, first uh, used by NVIDIA. And so you have the hypervisor down here. And on top of it, you have uh, the virtual machines running. Well, it can be uh, client uh, VMs, so to say, so the, the, the workstation VMs or the server VMs. So either Win7, Win8, or uh, Server 2012, uh, RDSH. And you connect to a client machine through a remoting protocol. That's all in one picture. And we're going to use the same picture again when we uh, will introduce the uh, 3D graphics remoting using hardware acceleration. Good. Now, if we look at remote effects, what it basically does in, uh, well, version two, um, it differentiates between uh, three different graphics formats. And one is text, one is still image, and the other is animation or video. So I did some color coding here. So the blue is the text, the red is the still image, and the green is, um, well, video or animation. So what happens then is those three different formats are treated separately. So you can see there are like three different pipelines that deal with the different formats. And in the end, they are brought into the RDP protocol and transmitted to the client. There is one exception to that because you can redirect video. Uh, and it depends on uh, the network conditions um, if video is redirected or not. It not always works as expected what you will see later in, in our videos. So uh, this media uh, stream goes through a separate virtual channel to the client side. 
On the client side, what you do is you receive everything and you have this um, not redirected media, so you have those three video streams that come through RDP, uh, three uh, media streams that come through RDP, text, still image, and video. So that's the upper side of things. So you use the CPU or a DSP to decode and display everything, or you have this redirected media content, which is uh, treated separately. And to be clear, so the, the, way the, um, the redirected media that we're talking about is, is classically the same as MMR in, uh, in RDP7. Yep. Um, and, and that is, of course, restricted to uh, Windows media types, not, not generic Windows media, not generic media redirection, but specifically Windows media content. And just to give you an overview of uh, some of the, the details of uh, uh, remote effects, so it, it, it can use UDP. Uh, that, is, that is something that is very important, in particular for the remote effects graphics uh, and audio video animation uh, streams. Um, it uses TCP for the peripheral, uh, and uh, the media redirection is still on TCP. The, the good thing is that they constantly monitor now the, uh, the bandwidth, and they adapt dynamically. And that has been introduced with uh, Remote FX version 2, which makes it a lot better compared to uh, the previous version. And uh, they also um, monitor latency and jitter. And the default frame rate, as it says here, is 25 frames per second. Well, the video is based on an H.264 uh, encoding and decoding technology. So they're using rather standard uh, things that they modified to make it uh, work better uh, for their particular uh, requirements. Anything else we should do? No? no that's good. Good. Now, looking at the setup that we have in our lab, so the idea is that we have a host machine with all the um, necessary test machines installed, the virtual machines installed there. So either Windows 7, Windows 8, or server 2012. And uh, so we have scripted test runs on those machines, on those virtual machines. We have a client to connect to uh, those virtual machines. And on the client, we see what the result is when the protocol goes through the wire. Now, in order to be able to record our tests, we connect to this client machine through an Epiphone box. The Epiphone box is something like the projectors that are here. So you take the video signal and feed it into this box, and this box converts it into a signal USB signal that is similar to a video camera. So you can attach yet another uh, PC to the output of the Epiphone box and record the video. So in total, this looks like that. that You have the client machine connected through USB to a recorder machine. This recorder machine records the, the raw video files. And between the client and the host, we have a WAN emulator. We're using the opposite box, the um, Linktropy Mini 2 as of today. We're going to change that in the near future because we want to have a more powerful uh, WAN emulator. But as of today, we are using the Linktropy Mini 2. Yeah, and it allows us to, to configure for, uh, different uh, network settings. For phase seven, we're switching to a uh, apposite uh, Netropy N60, which gives us gigabit speed emulation, multiple test scenarios. And we're also switching the Epiphan DVI USB to a PCI to USB uh, PCI uh, DVI uh, encoder that will give us uh, much higher frame rates, much higher resolution. So we'll be able to do some more complex tests than what we do today. Because now that we started uh, recording high-end graphics, we see the limits of this box. Because if you have high-end graphics uh, created in, in many, many frames per second, uh, this box cannot deal with that. So it goes down to like 10 to 15 frames per second. So we introduce artifacts into the videos that were not there on the client. So this is why we need better hardware for that. Um, the network emulation settings are, we have LAN settings, we have uh, settings uh, in the range of 50 milliseconds latency, different bandwidths, typically a, a packet loss that is uh, very small, except for some of the uh, scenarios where we added substantial packet loss in order to see how the protocols can deal with that. And we have those um, 200 milliseconds to 300 millisecond latency uh, setups. So 
The 50 milliseconds is if you stay within a continent. Uh, the 200 milliseconds is if you go across continents. And that's actually probably a bit further. So the, the emulation scenarios that we did, at least for US base, 50 milliseconds will get you anywhere within the US. You know, East Coast, West Coast, 50 milliseconds Same is true more in than Europe. enough. So. Um, uh, typically, intercontinental between like the US and Europe is only around 90 to 120 milliseconds. The 200 milliseconds is more sort of North America to APAC uh, type latency. So we wanted to make sure we're testing those scenarios as well. Okay. Uh, this is round trip. Round trip. <laughs> so after recording the, uh, the raw videos, so we have the raw videos uh, in, in, in a uh, fairly high resolution. It's uh, 1260 by uh, 1024. Uh, 1280 by 1024. Uh, 1280, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we reduce the resolution and we make sure that we have a fixed bit rate. Because if we use the raw videos, some of the raw videos are like 300 to 400 meg. It's always 45 second videos. So uh, creating that, that huge amount of data is, is a big challenge. And if you want to run them side by side, you want to make sure that it's fair. So uh, we re-encode them with a fixed bit rate and with a reduced size so that they fit nicely into a four up um, player, which allows us to run four videos side by side, or two videos plus additional information. You will see that later. So we can also inject uh, the uh, pictures of uh, network conditions, so that you can see two videos plus the information regarding um, the network. So this is how we do it. So it's, a, it's a, a many steps that are included here, and this is why typically it's a very short night uh, before presentations like we do it today. So last night, uh, I think I was up until 2 o'clock to put that all together. This morning we met very early uh, to finish everything. So, uh, because it's a lot of raw material. Right. So, let's just do it and dive into that. Before we really do that, I want to make you familiar with what the four ups look like. So you have, well, you will see it, what I did here. I wanted to make sure that you understand that we have a top left, a top right, a bottom left, and a bottom right. So um, it took me a while to record those videos. So um, it, was a, it was a fun afternoon because uh, typically people get overwhelmed when they see four ups the first time. And so I thought I'd make it a little bit simple for you guys uh, to, to get adjusted to those four up. Uh, scenario. <laughs> yeah, my son came into my lab and he thought that I got nuts. So. <laughs> Good. But this gives you an impression. So, as Sean pointed out, we have multiple faces. And uh, as a recap, um, here is face, something from face number four. And uh, that happened between last year and, and, and this year. So it's all in the, it all happened in the time uh, between Bry forums. So the first thing that I want to present to you is the quick time comparison between Windows 7 RDP 7.1, Windows 7 with HDX 5.6, Win 7 on RDP 8 with TCP, and Win 7 RDP 8 with UDP. Let's be clear. And, and so, uh, yep. The differences between the TCP and UDP, we actually forced RDP 8 to, f to use TCP only to make sure that it would not use UDP. The default is use UDP and fail back to TCP, so we enforced it. Yep. So, and we use it on 2 megabit 50 milliseconds. Um, uh, what we wanted to show is how much RDP 7 sucks if you compare it to RDP 8. But with this network conditions, you will see that RDP 8 TCP and RDP Eight UDP, you almost cannot differentiate between the two. Because UDP cannot benefit, or cannot give you any benefit, because there is no packet loss. This is 0.01% packet loss, so it's yep. typical corporate MPLS uh, networking with very, very low amounts of packet loss. So the UDP versus TCP is not going to give you a huge uh, differential benefit. As you start pumping latency up, or if you start introducing higher amounts of packet loss, that's where the UDP will actually start to really benefit. And you see also in the upper right 
that HDX performs pretty much in, a, in, a, in the same way as uh, um, RDP8 does. Good, but now let's introduce some packet loss at more latency. And now you're going to see the difference, what UDP can make. Yeah, it takes a while to establish, even though it's 12 megabit. You have 300 milliseconds latency and 1% packet loss now. And you can immediately see that this runs a lot smoother than that one. So this is TCP, this is UDP, and even HDX is struggling <clears throat> because it's also based on TCP. I mean, if you look at RDP7, it's completely unusable. So it's not a video what you see there. Everyone's seen this RDP7 tile-based painting before. <laughs> Anytime you try to use RDP7 over a WAN, it's quite painful. So this was one of the things that we wanted to share with you before we dive into the, uh, the newer scenarios. And the other one is, what does it look like if you're using uh, DirectX 9 with HDX 3D Pro so that you have a dedicated uh, GPU and compare it, which is not really fair, but compare it to uh, PC over IP uh, and to um, RemoteFX soft GPU. A VGPU. Uh, VGPU, VGPU. Um, and it's a shared GPU scenario, but just to give you an impression what the difference can be. And we are going to, for this, we use the grid card, and we have a grid card over here, but we will cover that later. But you see the difference. You have like 1,000 frames per second in the upper left. You have like 30 frames per second upper right. And you have 60 with remote effects. Remote effects does a, does a real good job here because, well, you're comparing different things because one is a dedicated uh, GPU that is running while the other is a shared GPU. And you see, it was stuttering. It stopped for a while. And it recovered. So uh, this was, this was uh, reproducible in the lab. So it, it's very interesting what, what's happening there. That's no, 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 this is 2 meg, 50 milliseconds. 2 meg, 50 So this is a WAN condition. Yeah. The thing to keep in mind with this is the upper left corner, which performed great, is a GPU pass-through, one GPU per user. So it's like a VDI desktop, and that user has the entire GPU core. These other models here, these are shared GPUs. So yeah. This is PC over IP uh, VSGA. So it's a shared API intercept graphics model. And even though it says it renders 1,000 frames per second, it yeah. does not deliver 1,000 frames per second. But you see the difference uh, uh, when it comes to rendering, how much faster it is if you have a dedicated uh, GPU later. We even compare with bare metal because we want, th th that's the ultimate goal. We want to be as fast as we can be with bare metal, also in a remoting scenario. Right. And can you test it with the uh, uh, Yes, we have results of that. We'll yep. be showing that after the 2D results. Good. So those were phase four and five, uh, phase five results. We have many more of them, but we just wanted to, to handpick some of those. And now, in order to make it a little bit simple for you to compare uh, the individual protocols, we put together, or we <laughs> against each other, uh, RDP7 and RDP8, and use a WPF uh, scenario on the LAN. And what you see here is not only what it looks like, you also see what happens on the network. And now look at that. RDP7 using up to 50 megabit per second in the, in the LAN scenario, while RDP8 over UDP goes down to like, well, five to six. So it's a, it's, a big difference. And the user experience in both cases is pretty much comparable. You don't yep. really see a difference in the user experience over the LAN. Now, we're not doing any kind of network latency and that kind of stuff, but if you compare straight RDP7 to RDP8 with UDP transport, uh, you've got a fraction of the bandwidth. And this is true in almost all tests yep. that you'll use RDP8 against RDP7. There are a few circumstances where RDP8 will use more bandwidth because it's more aggressive. Uh, but for the most part, I'd say 80 to 90% of what you would do will be less bandwidth on RDP8. But 10 times more, that was, that was really, almost 10 times more, that was really impressive uh, when, you, when you compare those two. Now, let's do the same thing for video. 
And this was a result that really surprised us. Because according to Microsoft, RDP8 was supposed to do a re-encoding under those network conditions. And obviously, it doesn't do it. Because you see, the results are similar. So both of them do a, uh, an MMR, multimedia redirection. And we had this conversation with the Microsoft guys, and they confirmed that this is a bug, and it will be fixed with the next release. So uh, that was really interesting to, to, to find well, out for us. The results are we thought we did something wrong, so we went to the uh, RDS team and asked them, hey, look at that. The results are very different in Windows 7 versus Windows 8. Uh, and Microsoft made a number of improvements in the uh, core graphics subsystem in Windows 8 that allows it to do a much, much better job at some of these things. But in the case of Windows 7, and we do most of our testing with Windows 7 because honestly that's a majority of what's deployed in enterprises today. We didn't want to do too much Windows 8 testing because enterprise adoption is actually very, very low right now. We have a few test results of some Windows 8 and Server 2012 stuff, but we're primarily focused around Windows 7 on the desktop. Yep. Um, but the important thing here is it is doing MMR, and on the LAN that's kind of what I'd expect to see happen. Um, on the WAN, however, we would expect to see some of these videos encoded in H.264 and delivered, but what we found on Windows 7 is it's very hit or miss. So I'm, I'm guessing that there are some bugs in the way that Microsoft is doing network detection that in some cases it thinks the network is better than it is and it's performing MMR when it should be doing a transcode of the video. Yep. So the next thing we wanted to do is to compare HDX versus RDP8, first on the LAN and later uh, doing the comparison uh, in uh, WAN conditions. So do the quick time, we're gonna do the quick time video again, comparing the two, and if we thought that uh, RDP8 is already doing a great job with the video, with the uh, quick time video, look at that, HDX does an even better job, but they introduce <laughs> more compression artifacts. Yeah. So they are more aggressive with their compression. And this is why they're using less bandwidth for obvious reasons. So it's up to you to decide what you want. You want to provide more bandwidth and have a better uh, user experience or you are bandwidth constrained? I think the important thing is in, in LAN conditions, it's probably not really that important. Although there are certain scenarios that we've shown you guys under RDP7 where uh, RDP7 will take up to 50, 60, 70 megabits on the LAN. And that can actually even be a problem for normal corporate environments because your core distribution switches, depending on how much bandwidth they have, if you've got 1,000 users using 70 megabits per second to watch content, that can overload your core switches. So uh, it is important even on the LAN, uh, depending on how much bandwidth they use. Question? Yes. Uh oh. Yeah, we did. We did not tune the uh, the, the quality parameters yeah. for uh, remote effects yeah, or RDP on the host. The question was about tuning. The question was about tuning. Did yeah. we tune something? We did no, not. We, didn't. we left everything at yeah. defaults. Yep. Correct. Yep. Correct. We did not. Uh, the intention that we always have with these things is to try to see how well they work out of the box without requiring tuning. And the reason why we do that is for a long time ago when we did like phase one and phase two, we were doing a lot of tuning, particularly of HDX and PC over IP and these kinds of things. And what we ended up realizing is that a lot of admins and a lot of end users don't understand the network conditions they're coming across. So they don't know what to tune for and therefore they make the wrong choices. So our idea was try to make it out of the box work as best as possible. And of course you can tune these to make them better, but we wanted to see how well they worked kind of out of the box. Yes. No, no VGPU. This is just straight up RDP. Is, yep. <clears throat> Correct. Yep. Yes. Just RDP. But again, that's that's that goes back to Microsoft calls everything remote effects, but then they differentiate. You know whether it's. Right. Correct. Right. We're going to discuss again, that later that's... because it's tricky. <laughs> correct. Yep. Yep. Correct. Yeah, we don't, we don't have screenshots in here of the different parameters that we're choosing, but in, in remote effects, what I call remote effects V1, the one that shipped with uh, Windows 7 uh, and Server 2008 R2 SP1, uh, that remote effects version or that variant 
you could only choose LAN connection settings in order to establish a remote effects connection. If you chose anything other than LAN, you would get classic RDP. There was no remote effects vGPU capability. So um, that's, it, it is somewhat frustrating. And some of that's been made better uh, with, uh, with Windows 8 and with, with remote effects RDP 8 solution. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you don't have to choose the LAN setting for that anymore, but that's, it's, a, it's a different, uh, different configuration. Well, let's cover that when we, when we sure. yeah, we can, do we can the, cover the that. 3D stuff. Okay, now I have a flash scenario, HDX versus um, RDP8, and I mean, look at that. Now, we should, we should be very clear <laughs> on why these results are so yeah. different. So <laughs> Citrix is one of the only uh, solutions on the market that has client-side flash fetching. So we're monitoring bandwidth between the host and the client. So in this circumstance, in the HDX test, the client <laughs> machine is fetching it directly from the internet. It's not connecting back to the hypervisor VM at all, <laughs> other than some control channel bandwidth. So this flash experience is actually pretty good, and we're using marginal amounts of bandwidth. Whereas in the case of the uh, RDP8 solution, uh, because this is so graphically intense, yeah. such a high frame rate, you're having a lot of bandwidth consumed. I mean, this is, this is the most graphics intense uh, flash animation we were able to, to uh, find. And uh, this is amazing. I, I, was, I was amazed how good the RDP uh, protocol was able to deal with that kind of, of animation. So it, it still produced in the range of, how many was that? About 20, 20, 20, 20 frames, frames per second and deliver 20 frames per second, this is amazing. So the, the only problem is even though it delivers 20 to 25 frames per second, because of the rate of change in the graphics, uh, it ends up creating it uh, very blurry. You get very, very lossy compression, which is hard to see in these quarter-sized yeah. video screens, but when RDP8 processed that 25 frame per second flash, uh, it was very blurry. Do you expect that to be transferred to Correct. What's up? Oh. I mean, there's, there's almost nothing you can do to predict what the next image is going to look like because the animation is so fast and it's random movements. So they have to retransmit every individual image. And, um, and here's another thing with Whack-A-Mole, uh, Sean's favorite game. It's the same thing, Flash. If you run it on the client side uh, instead of running on the host side, that's a, that's, a, that's a major difference. Even though the user experience is great on both sides. But this is in a LAN scenario. Yep. When, you, when you take a flash game like this over some higher uh, WAN uh, parameters, then it, the experience degrades when you don't have client side flash. Now, we introduced 8 megabit 50 milliseconds uh, uh, as a new network condition. And now we're going to take a look at the flash thing again. And now you will see the change. So again, this runs locally. And here it's under constrained conditions. So now it cannot use 80 uh, meg to deliver uh, the individual frames. And this is what you get. But after a while, it's not bad. Obviously, they're doing smart stuff. But you can see it's blurry, as uh, Sean said. They introduce uh, massive compression. This is V2. Yeah. yeah. V1 uh, doesn't work over 30 milliseconds of latency, 30 to 50, depending on how it's configured. This is, this is V2. Um, this is actually, in the case of the, the left hand side there, that's Zen Desktop 7. Yeah. So, so latest and greatest. Okay. So, are you expecting? They adapted. Well, the H.264 transcoding applies to video content uh, when you have image content that's progressive uh, renderer, so it's not actually a video transcode for that. Uh, I th I'm pretty certain that's just uh, image What do you think? Do you think it was, it was animation or, or, or still image? It's animation. It's animation. Yeah. So animation and video are treated as, as, uh, as, as identical in, in, that, in that case? In, in most cases. In most cases. Yeah, okay. Good. <laughs> Good. So let's get into your scenarios. So let's cover some uh, some some two D scenarios, and in the two D scenarios we have um, how do we get the okay 
Uh, in this one, we've got 12 megabits per second, 300 milliseconds of latency, and 1% packet loss. And you'll notice that RDP 7 over here, completely unusable. Um, RDP 8 over UDP actually performs quite well. And because of the fact that it's UDP based, um, you're going to see some very smooth uh, experience, uh, even though um, you're, you're having 1% packet loss. And the HDX solution up here running uh, Zen Desktop 7 uh, actually does a pretty decent job, even though TCP based protocols typically don't do that well with packet loss. And then up here, we have a bare metal solution, which is, of course, the ideal. Yep user this experience. But you can see here how the HDX one is degrading because of the high latency and packet loss, whereas this one's actually still quite smooth. Again, UDP lending a hand when you have packet loss. So it's actually quite nice. And uh, here you can see for the first time, uh, looking at the bare metal, because it's not as smooth as you would expect it to be on, on the local machine, on bare metal. So this is due to our video recording hardware that we have today. This is why we had to invest into new hardware. Because we found out, oh, huh, we need to make sure that it really looks good, that we have like 30 or 60 frames per second for the videos. But that's going to be a challenge to play back four videos simultaneously, because then you need to, to uh, provide the, uh, well, enough power to do that. Now, Yeah. So the question is, is UDP actually valid in remote scenarios? So, so that, that's a great question. Questions and, and about the answer, using UDP. So the, uh, the, the question was, uh, if you have a UDP-based transport protocol and you are connecting people through some form of, let's say, an SSL VPN or something like that, what is the impact of that? And the answer is, that sort of destroys the experience. Because um, where UDP gets its benefit from is the fact that you don't have to act your packets. Um, and if you're doing, uh, uh, wrapping it inside of a SSL VPN envelope, then you lose that capability. And if you have packet loss and retransmits, it will impair the UDP experience. Now that being said, almost everyone that does some form of UDP, like uh, RDP 8 is now supporting UDP, and VMware PC over IP, they have their own custom gateway solutions that can do uh, UDP proxying uh, from, an, from an external DMZ. So in those circumstances, if you use their solution as opposed to your own SSL VPN, you can still have a decent uh, experience, uh, even though you're connecting them through some form of a gateway proxy. So it depends on what you use. Do you know if the Netscape gateway supports UDP? Well, Citrix only uses UDP today for the real-time audio transport. They're not using it for any of their transcode video delivery. So they're still going to be TCP-based for that. So no real benefit there. Hey. Start that one. So in this one, again, we have bare metal. Again, no network connection at all. Here we have the Zen Desktop one. You notice this is not quite as good as bare metal, but we're still having a very fluid user experience uh, because we have client-side flash. So we're basically not going across the network oh, for like that, like that. RDP 7, completely unusable, not even, you know, I think it, it says like 0 0.1 frames per second, which is fantastic. Um, and then RDP 8, actually doing a good job, but you know, it definitely cannot compete with localized flash. Oh, so that's a good question. Um, so the reality of this is, on the bare metal circumstance, this is a quad-core CPU, uh, and it has a, uh, a K5, uh, uh, NVIDIA K5, K5 uh, K5000 thousand. card. Yeah. Uh, and depending on your flash configuration settings, you can 3D accelerate the flash content to some degree. Here, in this circumstance, this is a dual CPU, Core 2 Duo client machine where the flash is getting rendered. Yeah. So it's more powerful on the bare metal than it is on this one. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have a GPU, it has an Intel the, integrated the reason card, why we so did that is that why it's slower. Is we, we put that high-end machine together because later with the 3D tests, we wanted to compare the same thing, the same Kepler a GPU uh, on a client, but the Kepler GPU in a, in a, a K2 grid card uh, to make it fair. But Here, that, that in this is case, a great it's question. not fair because the, 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 this client machine, the bare metal machine, is by far more powerful. So uh, to, to respond back to what Dan was saying, yep. if this was the same client PC, the experience on HDX flash redirection should be identically equal to this bare metal one. Yep. So sorry about that. We should be more clear that this is different hardware. Yes. Again, none of this is vGPU. Yes, we're going yep. to be covering yep. some of the soft GPU, yep. so let's, we'll get to that. Good. 
Uh, do we need to skip through some of these yeah. along the way? What do you let's, want? Um, let's go down to this one. Yeah, you have got another like 15 minutes for the okay. for the the 2D scenarios. So some interesting things happen here, and we, we're still not exactly <laughs> sure why uh, why the the water it's color in some of these it's turns out to be in red. The water. <laughs> we, we think maybe you know, there's a shark in it, whatever. But in a bare metal situation, the water should be blue. You get the nice water effects. Again, this is a GPU on it, so it's a little, it's not a quite fair comparison. But in these where there's not a GPU, Zen Desktop 7 is saying it's getting about 23, 24 frames per second. You can see the fish fairly fluidly. And again, this is 2 megabit, 50 milliseconds. Down here, RDP 7.1, uh, you know, it was a very, very poor user experience. Uh, even here, with the UDP-based transport with RDP-8, not doing very well, and the reason for that is because the 2 megabit becomes limiting uh, with RDP-8. We need more bandwidth than 2 meg to run yep. this test effectively. So what we can do is take a look at how that test would look if we increase our bandwidth and go up to an 8 megabit uh, network pipe. And uh, even the 8 meg network pipe doesn't completely fix uh, RDP-7. It's a little bit better, but the frame rate's still quite low. Under uh, RDP-8, uh, you're now seeing we're getting a resultant frame rate that's pretty close to matching what the HDX solution is using. And more importantly, we're seeing fluid movement of the fish in the fishbowl. So given enough bandwidth, and again, what we've been seeing in our testing is it's about somewhere between 30 to 50% more bandwidth of most of the similar HDX results. Yes. Yeah, you can see some pretty heavy artifacting. Yes. I don't think it's progressive. I just think it's a second jitter. It's heavily compressing it. I mean, progressive only kicks in when the content is static. Right. Not all well static. The exact two zeros are still in. Yeah. Right. Let's go back. I want to jump into this one, an HTML5 test result that's actually quite interesting. So this one starts out kind of slow. There's not a lot of movement, so most of the screen is fairly static. Uh, so there's not going to be a lot, of, a lot of bandwidth used. But as the animations start, the, uh, this is 2 megabit 50 milliseconds. And you see that you have a lot of stuttering with the RDP7 solution. Uh, also, the RDP-8 solution also stutters quite a bit when compared to the HDX solution. And a lot of this, again, is 2 megabit is not enough for RDP-8 to deliver a good experience with the, uh, with the, the motion graphics RDP that we're using here. RDP-8 on Win 7. We are always talking about Win 7 here. To be very clear, things may look different on Win 8. So that's the lessons that I learned. So again, if we look at that same thing and now increase ourselves to uh, 8 megabits of bandwidth, you now notice that the RDP-8 solution does get quite smooth video. And even RDP-7, given 8 megabit, performs you know, quite, quite decently. And then the last one we want to show on Monster is when we increase the latency to 300 milliseconds and introduce 1% packet loss. And what you notice up here is that the HDX solution is actually beginning to stutter in some cases because of the high latency, because of the packet loss. So this is a circumstance where the UDP-based transport, in the case of RDP-8, is actually doing a pretty decent job here, whereas the HDX solution being TCP-based is having more stuttering. So when packet loss uh, is involved, of course, the, uh, the UDP-based solutions kind of help you out quite a bit there. Is this a video or some sort of WebGL demo? This is HTML5. So this is WebGL or something like that? Yeah, uh, no, it doesn't require WebGL because that would require a GPU. This is not GPU-based. Not always, of course, yeah. So let's do uh, WMVHD and take a look at that. And we had some interesting results with Windows Media content <laughs> uh, because the default configuration of RDP7 uh, is always going to be to try to MMR the video. So you're going to get very, very slow results when you're bandwidth constrained. This is 2 megabit, 50 milliseconds uh, in, in all of these results here. And both uh, RDP7 and RDP8 uh, are both doing MMR in this circumstance. Uh, so that's quite interesting because there should be circumstances with this where we don't actually <laughs> perform MMR. One clarification, RDP-8 on Windows 7 always does MMR, only in Windows 8 does the RDP-8. Ah. Lower bandwidth, higher latency, and then switch back to using that source. 
Ah, so good reason to use uh, Windows 8 in that circumstance. How hard to use the disable layer mod? Yeah. And fall back to host side rendering. Is there any chance that we will see another uh, sort of implementation of RDP 8 for Win 7 in the future that goes beyond what we see today? Uh, not that I know. Okay. That would obviously involve a lot more yeah. work than yeah. just. Yeah, I can imagine because yeah. uh, to be very clear, the graphics, the graphics system, uh, the graphics stack uh, in Windows 8 is, is fundamentally different to the one in Win 7. So uh, the graphics system uh, on Win 8, well, it, it is very good for remoting scenarios. And you have to, to add that to Windows 7 because it was never built to be like that. And that makes it really challenging for Microsoft to sort of backport all the functionality to Windows 7. We also have an interesting result here. We, we have this uh, JavaScript photo gallery, which is, of course makes a high <laughs> amount of, uh, of graphical change on screen. And of course, RDP 7 painting, you know, block at a time, not really usable. Um, RDP 8 in this circumstance actually doing a pretty decent job, even given the fact that it only has two megabits of bandwidth available to it. Uh, likewise, HDX doing a, a very decent job. Um, well, mo both of these pretty close to bare metal experience, even though they're going over a two megabit network, whereas bare metal has no network involved. It's just local graphics. <laughs> And I want to also cover the Silverlight Deep Zoom. Now, Benny and I have a bit of a glitch with this Silverlight demo that we didn't notice when we were first building these tests. Um, but the way that we're performing the, uh, the coordinate zoom ends up zooming a different location. Uh, but what I wanted to show that's interesting about this is that um, on a bare metal situation, you have very fluid zoom in and zoom out. On the two megabit solutions, we have definitely a little bit of delay uh, in the frame rate where you can notice the stuttering that's occurring. And typically the reason for that is because the, the video, uh, the, the bandwidth that would be required to deliver it smoothly is going to be greater than two megabits per second. So you end up getting a, a bit of slowness in there. What's that? We love the painting. The painting? The painting? Yeah. Well, that was the alternative to the other demo that I wanted to do. Yeah, I think it was better that we used this one. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so what we then also tried with the Silverlight Deep Zoom is to increase the bandwidth to 8 megabits to give the, the protocols a better chance at providing more fluid user experience. So uh, up here again, we have bare metal as if it's running locally on the PC. And then here we have HDX. And down here we have RDP8. Uh, and again, RDP8, even with 8 megabits of bandwidth, is providing a little bit more stuttering in the, in the experience. Uh, whereas HDX, you can notice, even though these are zooming different spots, there is absolutely no user experience differential between running this over an 8 meg network versus running it local. You see pretty much the exact same look and feel, which is quite nice. Okay, do we want to, uh, I don't know how we are on time, do you want to jump into... Yeah, we can have another five minutes for, okay. the, for the 2D cool. stuff. Yep. So I want to Very also cover a, a flash HD video. In the case of Flash, again, we're, we're going to have a, a great experience in HDX because of the client-side Flash uh, content fetching. So in the case of Flash, we've got a very fluid video here. In the case of RDP8, because of the constrained 2 megabit 50 milliseconds of bandwidth, uh, we're, we're getting a, a stuttering user experience again. And in RDP7.1, as I said, completely unusable. Uh, something that you definitely could not actually watch this video. But look at HDX, you almost cannot differentiate between the two, yeah? Yeah, because again, this is client-side yeah. flash uh, 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 fetching, so it's basically the same as if it's, it was bare metal. Yeah. Yep. So I, I, should, I should bring up a point about that. While client-side Flash is, is a great technology and provides a lot of good uh, experience benefits for, for Flash, the important thing to remember is that it does, of course, depend that the client-side uh, machine has a Flash player, that it's a version that, that matches a supported version, um, that the person has an internet connection that you know, allows them to pull that data down faster than, than run, rendering it host-side. Um, and most importantly, if you do client-side flash fetching, you have to keep in mind that you do have the uh, exposure, potentially, of exposing the client-side machine to a vulnerability. Uh, if you direct the person to a flash content on your host environment, you can compromise their client-side flash player with that redirection. So there are some risks in doing client-side flash, uh, but the user experience is actually quite good. And then the last one I want to show is uh, the flash HD video now with, uh, with 8 megabit. 
Uh, and of course, the client side flash is going to perform just like bare metal because it's, uh, it's doing this effectively the same thing. But now that we've got eight megabits of bandwidth, you're now able to see that uh, RDP8 is actually performing a pretty good job at this, even though it's uh, host side rendering and, and transmitting that across. Whereas RDP7 is, uh, is struggling a bit, uh, even with the eight megabits of bandwidth. And a lot of this um, can be explained if you looked at some of our earlier two up results comparing RDP7 to RDP8, that you know, RDP8 in most cases uses about one tenth of the bandwidth. Uh, so when you are constrained even to eight megabit, if RDP7 was trying to push 60 megabits per second, uh, it's just, it's not gonna work well when you constrain to eight. Whereas RDP8 does a great job with before, that. Before we jump to uh, the 3D stuff, um, just to give you an impression how we do the testing, because all these video recordings, uh, how we do those. So here in this machine, I have uh, a client Hyper-V running, and I have two of those test machines, Windows 7 and Windows 8, running on that. And that's exactly the test setup that we have in our lab as well. And uh, here's a Windows 7, here's the Windows 8 machine. And if I just start like one of the scenarios, this is what we typically do. We give it the scenario number, it's a, an auto -it script that runs, and at this stage, I click both enter on the client side and enter on the recording machine to record the, the 45 uh, minute uh, second uh, video clip. And you see here on Windows 7, I cannot run that particular demo because it's not supported on Windows 7. While if I do the same thing on uh, Windows 8, it does its job. And uh, here it's soft GPU now. So it uses RemoteFX uh, soft GPU. Um, and uh, so you see the performance here. As I said, this is the way we record those videos. So uh, you sit in your lab and you do the same thing uh, every 45 seconds over and over and over again. So our wives, they find it really funny that we are watching the same videos again and again. And uh, now I hired my son, he's 16 years old, and he wanted to make some money in the summer break. And I said, okay, now you sit down and you click here, and uh, that, works, uh, that works quite nice. I think I need an intern. <laughs> Good. Uh, let's move on. So we want to talk a little bit about uh, graphics uh, and, and how uh, more high-end 3D graphics uh, impacts the virtual desktop scenario or, or terminal services scenario. Uh, the important thing to think about, though, is that there's different categories of people and what level of graphics they're going to require. So if you think about the typical task worker, most of what they need to have is some fairly basic stuff in terms of, you know, Windows Arrow. If you're using, you know, Windows 7, you want to support Windows Arrow Glass theme. Uh, that would be something that a typical task worker might use. Um, they might also use some very, very low-level graphics um, that uh, is, you know, DirectX 9 type stuff. It's some very, very low-level stuff. And a lot of that can be done with software-rendered graphics. So uh, soft GPU solution, like in the case of uh, uh, RDP8 supports soft GPU under Windows 8, or in the case of PC over IP has their SVGA uh, 3D solution that can support Aero. Uh, that's pretty much all you really need to cover for a, a task worker. When you get into a knowledge worker, you're gonna require some higher level of graphics performance. And the higher level of graphics performance means you're probably gonna have some form of a GPU uh, on, the, uh, on the host machine. Um, and we covered kind of knowledge worker and power user. This might be something like uh, PowerPoint uh, uses uh, DirectX 10 animations in PowerPoint 2013. So if you want to have a fluid uh, experience when you're doing your slide animations uh, in PowerPoint 2013, you're going to need to have some form of a, a GPU uh, to support that. So uh, knowledge, knowledge workers and power users can get by typically with API intercept. And API Intercept today uh, is supporting DirectX 9, DirectX 10, and DirectX 11, depending on which solution you're talking about. So RemoteFX is supporting uh, all of those. Uh, when you get up in the power user uh, situation, this is where you're going to have more uh, advanced graphics formats that you need, like uh, you're doing Photoshop, you're doing some, uh, some uh, things that are requiring more graphical intensity. For the, for the designers. Uh, well, some of that can also bleed oh, okay. into the power, power user, user category, yeah, correct. but uh, when you get up in the designer, this is really where your Katea uh, type of stuff is, CAD engineering applications, and that's really where you're going to want a dedicated GPU per user, or potentially down the road, virtualized GPU support, which is not currently uh, capable. And as I said, this is um, something you can kind of debate depending on which side of the coin you believe in, but Microsoft calls the RemoteFX uh, vGPU, it's virtualized uh, yep. GPU. Um, whereas uh, the NVIDIA perspective is, is that that's really kind of more like API intercept. It's not actually presenting 
uh, a virtualized graphics processor to the, uh, to the individual This, this is why I had to modify this title several times to make sure that we are talking about the right thing here, that we don't confuse people. Uh, because vGPU is, is used in, in, different, in, in yeah. different ways. But clarify, but this is using API instead. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So what you do is, uh, well, you have your, your uh, drivers that come with the hypervisor that are inside the, um, uh, the VMs. And you cannot add an additional driver that is talking to your GPU into the VM. So in the case so, of the API intercept, the hypervisor is actually sharing access to the yep. graphics card. You're not actually loading an NVIDIA driver inside the VM and having direct access to a real, you know, uh, uh, so NVIDIA provides access to CUDA and that kind of stuff, but yep. you can't expose that when you're doing API intercept. You can expose it when you're doing true virtualized GPU or doing direct dedicated GPU pass through. It's on the NVIDIA site? Oh, really? Okay. Are you covering that also for remote FX or no? Okay. So does, does Microsoft have something about what you're covering? Yeah. So here are the requirements that you need if you want to use RemoteFX uh, vGPU, uh, SLAT, and DirectX capable GPU, and uh, full installation of Server 2012, and Hyper-V, and RDVH. Um, and you, it requires Windows 7 Enterprise Service Pack 1, uh, including, well, no, not including the KP patches. Yeah. Uh, that was the, the thing that I did wrong, because in my lab, I installed everything. Uh, Windows 7, Enterprise, Service Pack 1, I installed the RDP8 knowledge base patches and I tried to connect from my Windows 8 client machine and I never had vGPU until I found out that I have to uninstall the KB patches in order to fall back to RDP7 and then it would use RDP7 remote effects vGPU. Whoa, this is really complicated because it's, I don't think it's documented anywhere. <laughs> and uh, it confused me because I thought I installed all the latest stuff and it just did not behave the way I expected it to be. While in his lab it worked, but the reason was he used a Windows 7 machine without yeah. the uh, KB patches installed. So during the negotiation there was no um, RDP 8 support on both sides, so it fell back to RDP 7 even though he had the, the KB patches installed in the VMs. So we had different results. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Because I always compared only what we did in the virtual machines and not what, what was the client. I think the two most important things about uh, remote FX uh, vGPU in Server 2012, go back. Oh, excuse me. The two most important things <laughs> you need to make sure you, you know is that um, you must have a DX11 capable GPU. Uh, the, the remote FX V1, or what I call V1, that was in 2008 R2 SP1, uh, supported DX10 uh, graphics cards, but now in the Server 2012 edition, it's only supporting DX11 graphics cards. So you must have a fairly recent modern uh, GPU to support that. We, we had good graphics cards. Yeah, we were originally using <laughs> Quadro FX 3800s, but those are not DX11 capable, yep. so you can't, you can't use those with uh, remote FX 2012. Uh, the other thing that's important to know is that you cannot do vGPU with any edition of Windows client other than Enterprise. So there's some reason why Microsoft decided to tie that only to Enterprise Edition, but uh, you cannot use Professional or whatever. A MacBook Pro? Yeah, with the huh? NVIDIA card, that's a yeah. MacBook Pro. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, coming back to NVIDIA. Uh, NVIDIA was, was so nice to give us uh, K2 cards, um, plus they gave us K5000 cards. So I brought this thing with me. So these are the K5000 uh, 
the K, this is a K2 card. And what you can see here, it comes with two Kepler GPUs. The K1 comes with four Kepler GPUs, but they are smaller. Less number of CUDA Less, cores. Yeah. So the, yeah. the K1, I'm pretty sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's like 768 CUDA cores per GPU. Yep. And on the K2, it's 3,072 uh, CUDA cores and per GPU. Is that correct? It's 1,500 yeah, here. 1,500 per year, so it's 3,000 for the card. 1,536. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's on oh, here. Oh, it's on there. It's, it's on here. <laughs> Sorry. So 3,000 uh, CUDA cores uh, in the K2. We had to buy new cases for those cards because they're big. And uh, so now we have uh, gaming cases. Uh, my kids love that. <laughs> so they think it's for the first time uh, I have cool stuff in my lab. And um, well, that's what it is. So that's what we're using. Yeah. Now we've got the actual yeah. cards here. We don't need to show that. that. And this is what it looks like if you configure it uh, with Hyper-V. So what you see here is it shows uh, one of the, VD, uh, of, the in, uh, of the Kepler chips uh, uh, that it's assigned to uh, VM or to, uh, to, to one of the VMs. Uh, but the, the, the thing is, it only gives it 80 meg per, per VM. Well, it depends on, uh, so within RemoteFX, yep. you have a configuration setting on how many monitors and what resolution yep. you want to support. And based upon the number of monitors you want to support, that's the VRAM allocation that it makes uh, per VM. Um, and I've asked Microsoft a while back, like, is there the capability to tune this or to allocate more VRAM if you want to sort of like give more GPU access to one particular machine? And I was told that that was not something that was planned. Yeah. Uh, they're just letting uh, RemoteFX and Hyper-V handle that. So. Right. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's why I had asked yeah. if, if that was configurable. Correct. And I was told that's not configurable. Because if I only have one, one VM on the box and I have, uh, well, a grid, a grid card, <laughs> um, I would at least want to use the, the four gig. Yeah, well, and from, from my perspective, and, and Microsoft can feel free to tell me that I'm completely wrong on this, but I don't think the design objectives for remote effects when they created this was really high-end graphics. It was not intended to do you know, CAD engineering, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Good. And this is how it works if you have GPU path through, because now you can really install the driver, the NVIDIA driver in the VM, and the VM can talk to the grid card or the quadro cards directly. So this gives you the maximum performance from the, uh, from the GPU. Now, in order to use the GPU pass-through, you have to uh, use a particular hypervisor. So in the case of Zen Server, you have to be, generally speaking, on, on 6.1 or later. They had some early support in it for 6.02, but 6.1 or later or 6.2 would be ideal. In the case of uh, VMware, the official uh, support for VDGA is not there yet. It is currently in tech preview. Yeah, this so is you why it's in brackets. GPU pass through, yep. uh, but it's not officially supported at this time. So the only supported models for VMware today is VSGA, which is an API intercept. And the problem with the API intercept under uh, VMware View is it's only supporting DirectX 9 uh, and uh, some early OpenGL up until like uh, 2.1, I believe. They're not supporting the full OpenGL spec and the full DirectX uh, specification. So it's somewhat limited. Good. Um, I mean, the, it's, the code is there. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it is tech preview. You can use it now. It's just uh, they, they haven't committed to when it will be um, finally production supported. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a little glitchy right now, but it does work. So let's take a look at the uh, 3D results for the next like 10 minutes. And here we go. The floor is yours. So uh, <laughs> we did a couple different things. We, we took a look at a, a fairly uh, simple DirectX 9 based um, a test being uh, Google Earth. And we have uh, the bare metal up here, of course, which is going to provide the, the best user experience on the, on the uh, K5000 card. We have a LAN-based Windows 7 with HDX3D Pro, so this is dedicated GPU pass-through on Zen server. Then we have RemoteFX vGPU uh, under Windows 7, and over here we have Server 2012 
with Zen Desktop 7 App Edition. So this is a GPU sharing, this is a GPU sharing through different methods, uh, and this is dedicated and dedicated up here. And what you'll notice is that the HTX 3D Pro with dedicated is actually very fluid in terms of the user experience. These down here, you can definitely see some stuttering, but over the LAN, it's actually not that noticeable. It's, it's quite usable, uh, both with uh, Remote FX vGPU, as well as with uh, the Server 2012 uh, Zen Desktop 7 App Edition. The interesting thing that I thought from this here is if you have not such a good um, bare metal machine, you may run into a situation that your remoted session will beat from a performance perspective, your local performance. <laughs> but it requires high-end graphics cards in, in, on the host side. Now, we also looked at doing <laughs> DirectX 9 through Google Earth over some network conditions. And uh, trying to do this over 2 megabit can be challenging because it's not a lot of bandwidth for, for high-end graphics. But the thing that really impressed me was HDX 3D Pro actually makes this almost identical user experience yeah. to bare metal. This is only going over a 2 megabit network which to me was quite shocking. I expected this to be poorer than that uh, before we ran this set of tests. And what you'll notice in the case of, um, we did, in this case we did Zen Desktop 7 App Edition on Server 2012, and we're doing RemoteFX uh, vGPU on Windows 8. Now the reason why we did vGPU on Windows 8 is because we can't do vGPU over network conditions on Windows 7. The vGPU support for RemoteFX, uh, as you heard, only supports LAN connection parameters. You can, ch you can set it to LAN and do it over an emulated network, but it's so horrifically bad in performance, it wasn't worth showing you the results. So we ended up going to Windows 8 in this circumstance, which I realize is not exactly fair comparing Windows 8 to Windows 7, but we couldn't do vGPU on Windows 7 and do a comparison. So we introduced Windows 8 for that. Then we uh, tried to bring this up to uh, some higher bandwidth to try to see if uh, the remote effects or the Zen Desktop 7 app edition on Server 2012 would start to close the performance gap and get a little bit better once they had more bandwidth available. And again, you see that the user experience on uh, Zen Desktop 7 HDX 3D Pro is quite similar to bare metal, very, very good user experience. What you're noticing now is that the Zen Desktop 7 App Edition on Server 2012 and the vGPU on Windows 8 is actually getting much closer to the user experience. You still see some loss of frame rate. It's not quite as smooth, but it's definitely much better than it was under 2 megabit. So having the extra bandwidth available does make this uh, a bit more usable uh, on, on vGPU on Windows 8 and on Server Click. 2012. Click. Yep. Yeah. And the one, one last test we wanted to do with Google Earth was, what happens when we introduce some loss? So now we have 300 milliseconds of latency and 1% packet loss. So this is a, definitely a, a kind of near around the world type connection. And uh, what's interesting about this is, now that we have the packet loss, you will start to see a little bit of stuttering in the HDX 3D Pro solution, because we are TCP based. Um, and the uh, server uh, 2012 Zen Desktop 7 app edition is really stuttering a lot. Again, this is TCP based, so having the packet loss and having the uh, high latency is making this one stutter quite a bit. Uh, not surprisingly, the UDP based uh, uh, RDP 8 actually is doing a much better job uh, in the loss conditions than what the, uh, the server 2012 and the HDX 3D Pro is doing. So quite a good job once you have loss involved. So let's PowerPoint? jump to uh, PowerPoint. Let's yeah. PowerPoint. This is an interesting one. This is an interesting, yeah. So PowerPoint 2013 <laughs> uses uh, DirectX 10 for doing the slide animations. And so under Windows 7, you can't do DirectX 10 with vGPU. So you're seeing falling back to uh, CPU-based uh, rendering of all the animations. So it, it goes very, very poorly. Uh, we have over here uh, uh, Zen Desktop 7 App Edition on Server 2012, which with the GPU pass-through can leverage the uh, DirectX 10 graphics. And you're seeing pretty much like you are with HDX 3D Pro, a near perfect uh, experience uh, over the LAN. But again, with the LAN, we have lots of bandwidth, and so it's, uh, it's, it's kind of to be expected. But we also ran uh, the same test over the LAN and now we introduced uh, RemoteFX vGPU 7 and RemoteFX vGPU 8 on Windows 8. <laughs> and now that you have uh, vGPU on Windows 8, we can do DirectX 10 and DirectX 11. And now you see in a LAN scenario, this is pretty much bare metal user experience. Yep. So the graphics this stack is, on is... Windows 8 for RemoteFX is obviously much, much better than it was in Windows 7. So it becomes very obvious that Windows 8 is the machine to remote into if you want to use RemoteFX. <laughs> And, oh, 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 oh. Oops, sorry. Yeah. 
We also uh, we, we purchased a professional edition of uh, 3D Mark uh, benchmarking software. Now, we don't like to do a lot of games and those kind of things, but wanted to see if we had a, a much stronger uh, GPU-based benchmark, how would these solutions do? So this is based on a LAN. Um, and so HDX 3D Pro actually doing a pretty decent job, not quite as fluid as the, uh, the bare metal solution, but uh, definitely usable. And uh, we also have the Windows 8 RemoteFX VGPU, and it's actually doing surprisingly well. And now this, again, this is a DirectX 9 based test, um, but because VGPU is not uh, supporting uh, uh, the, the graphics rendering, uh, actually this one, in this case, they support uh, they, they don't have support for the, uh, the GPU in, uh, in the um, Windows 7 scenario. And the last ones we wanted to do just to highlight uh, a deficiency in uh, remote effects at this point in time, there is absolutely no support for OpenGL, hardware acceleration of OpenGL under remote effects. So we have no <laughs> video available, uh, even under Windows 8, there's no OpenGL other than a software 1.1. Here we have Server 2012's NS.7 App Edition. Now this frame rate, of course, is not real, <laughs> um, but this is, uh, <laughs> this is no. GPU pass-through, but it thinks it's getting many more frames than it actually is. And HDX 3D Pro, pretty much matching bare metal performance, but again, this is on a LAN uh, situation. Last one. And the last one is a WebGL Aquarium. And this one's interesting. Again, we have nothing on Windows 8 because there's no OpenGL support. On Server 2012 versus uh, Zen Desktop 7 HDX 3D Pro, you'll notice both of them can run this because they both have a GPU provided to them in the hypervisor. The key difference is the frame rate, which you can't really see very well here. I may have to look at it on the screen to see the, the frame rate numbers. You're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30 to 40 or 50 frames in the HDX 3D Pro. In the case of Server 2012, we're seeing about six to eight. So definitely, even though we're passing through GPU, the Server 2012 method of sharing it on a Zen app model does not yield anywhere near. Hey, hey oh, look there we at go. that. Huh? Uh, it doesn't yield anywhere near the equivalent performance of what uh, HDX 3D Pro does uh, when you're trying yeah, to share the, the graphics. It's like 50, yeah, between 30 and, and 40 frames here. But no other users. No so other single users. user, they have access to the entire single Kepler. Uh, it's a grid K2, but um, you can only GPU pass through one of them to a VM, so it's yep. one entire Kepler for the Server 2012 box, but it's one user. So we're, we're definitely not seeing contention for the GPU, it's just on Server 2012 trying to share it, you, you get less performance than you would if you were doing a Windows 7 machine with a pass-through GPU. So, okay, let's go back and do some quick summary. Yep. Here we are. So, uh, RemoteFX uh, and RemoteFX Soft GPU, if you're on Windows 8, really has become head-to-head -head with HDX and PC over IP uh, in sort of the task worker, knowledge worker, and some power user scenarios. And we say head-to-head, -head, we mean in terms of user experience. Of course, the bandwidth on the wire isn't always the same, and we've been seeing in general that RemoteFX and RDP is using, in some cases, as much as 20 to 50 time, or 20 to 50 percent more bandwidth than what HDX or PC over IP is doing in the same situation. Um, obviously, we've already alluded to this earlier. If you want to use vGPU or soft GPU performance, you really want to be doing this on Windows 8, not on Windows 7. The graphics stack on Windows 8 is far superior yep. to what is in Windows 7. And so. we're really looking forward to do the same test with Windows 8.1, to yeah. be very clear, and Server uh, 2012 R2, because that's the natural next step that we want to do, because uh, we believe that the adoption rate for Windows 8.1 will be uh, much, much better than it is for Windows 8. And, hmm? <laughs> so it's gonna be Windows 7 or Windows 8.1, so that's gonna be. One um, of the most important things, I think, if you're doing some uh, more high-end graphics work, is one of the biggest gaps for remote effects today is the fact that they only support OpenGL software rendering yep. to the 1.1 <clears throat> specification. In 1.1, people haven't been writing to for probably 10, 15 years. Um, everyone is creating OpenGL code that is 2.x, 3.x, 4.x. So the biggest gap in my mind, uh, if you're trying to do any kind of decent graphics uh, for remote effects, is that there's no OpenGL support. Now Microsoft says, we understand this is a gap, we, we, you know, we haven't committed to working on it, but we understand the problem, we know that people want it, uh, but there's been no committed information about when they may uh, support OpenGL uh, in the future. So that's somewhat that's uh, up in the air a bit. 
Um, and Microsoft does not provide a dedicated GPU solution. If you want to do high-end graphics, you cannot do it on RemoteFX today because really, really high-end graphics requires you to do GPU pass-through and have full access to the GPU. RemoteFX gives you a little slice uh, of the graphics processor. Now, something that we've not been able to do any testing with yet because the code is not yet complete uh, is NVIDIA and Citrix have been collaborating together on virtual GPU technology where you actually are able to load the grid driver into the machine but still share the GPU across uh, multiple uh, VMs. It requires a sort of a broker in the hypervisor that does the brokerage of the individual VMs communicating with the GPU. So that's, that's stuff we're hoping to, uh, to do uh, later on this year, beginning of yep. next year, when that code becomes complete. Um, I believe there's going to be a tech preview that will be coming out in the next few months. So once that ships, we'll start doing testing with that and hopefully have yep. some results next year on the uh, NVIDIA and Citrix uh, vGPU. But the general problem there is, uh, to, to my knowledge at this point, no other vendors have committed to doing virtual GPU in their, in their stack. So we'll have to wait and see what VMware's plans are, if they're going to support virtual GPU, if Microsoft will support it. Um, I'd expect, personally, Microsoft to be the last people to support it because they have the whole <laughs> Callista technology, and that would kind of be a completely different approach than what they're doing. So, um, but VMware may very well end up adopting uh, virtual GPU as well. We'll have to wait and see what happens. But the good news is, because the question at the beginning was, is RDP 8 and remote effects ready for the enterprise? Yes, for many scenarios, they are. And it's more scenarios than ever before. This is the good news. But there are still high-end scenarios where it requires, well, the other protocols, because they do a better job with OpenGL and, and uh, right. supporting direct access to the GPU. And one of the most important takeaways that we did not include in the summary here, but I want to make sure I clarify for everyone. Um, you know, Microsoft has the vGPU te technology, and then they have the classic RDP. If you're not doing high-end 3D graphics, you just have RDP 7 or RDP 8. Um, the most important thing to know about RDP 8 is, is a free download and you can apply it to every single Windows 7 endpoint in your organization. You don't have to have enterprise like you do for vGPU. Uh, you don't have to have it on a hypervisor or Hyper-V. You can do it on physical endpoints, yep. desktops, laptops, VMs, everywhere. And it is markedly better in almost yep. every single situation than RDP 7 is. So I highly encourage you guys to go out and download the two hot fixes uh, that enables RDP 8. Yep. You need to configure it in Windows 7 in group policy or in local security policy to enable it because it doesn't turn on by default. Um, but uh, modify that in yep. group policy, roll out the patches, and start using RDP 8 within your uh, uh, internal network environments. And it runs on other hypervisors as well. Yes. That's the question that is always asked in the forums. Does it work on my, uh, well, VMware? Uh, it will work on uh, VMware. It will work on, on Hyper-V. It will work on Zen Server. Yep. It will even work on physical desktops yep. and laptops. So put RDP 8 everywhere in your organization. It is fantastic. Uh, Microsoft really yep. did close the gap. Uh, against HDX and PC over IP for all of the lower end information worker, task worker type people. It's pretty much neck and neck uh, for most of the use cases. Okay, that's so, about it. Thank you very much Thanks. for coming. Thank you. Thank you.